So welcome to this week's Treasury Career Corner podcast, where I interview treasury professionals about their treasury careers. Each and every week, I talk to treasurers about how they built their careers, where they are now, and where they see both themselves and the treasury profession going to next. In this week's show, delighted to be joined by Luke Vlamink, the group treasurer at Remy Quantro. Obviously, uh, one of my favorite products, you know, loving the drink and things like that. We're going to really get into some of the industry. But for those of you who don't know, Remy Quantro is a French family-run group whose origins date back to 1724. And they've been, you know, making some beautiful drinks ever since now. I've been to Luke's offices. We've seen some of the beautiful ones, and I've sampled a few of them. But the group itself, a number of different partnerships and different things, 1,800 employees around the group globally. But I'm going to get Luke to describe a bit more about the group itself. But what we're going to do is we're going to start off. Luke is going to start at the beginning of his career a few years ago now, but how he got his introduction to finance and then treasury, all planned, of course, as we always know, and then bring it up to date and go from there. So, Luke, enough from me, sir. Over to you. If I just need to, to start from beginning, I accidentally started my career at Swift, which is for a treasurer kind of comic situation, but not in the treasury department. I started my career in the accounting department, I was in charge of compiling the budget uh, process of Swift. Then I moved to the uh, real accounting world and especially in the accounts payable. A few months later, they were creating kind of treasury department and I was asked to join the team to start the treasury adventure at Swift. Ironically, I didn't have any implication in the operation of Swift, but like any other company, treasury needs to be managed. And so that's where I started my journey in the treasury world. And then uh, I stayed there for 14 years. So. I I had uh, plenty of time to uh, contemplate the Swift development in the financial world because when I joined Swift, they were not uh, live yet. Uh, they were still in testing mode. And then I was uh, just for, for the anecdote, I was the employee number 100. 20, and when I left Swift, there was more than 3,000 employees. So wow. <laughs> that was a, a nice journey. Luke, we spoke before the show and because we talked about the fact that you came from accounting background yeah. and then discovered Treasury and the sort of having, you gave this mirror analogy, which was amazing about you know knowing what was happening. What was that like? That was a kind of revelation because uh, as you may know, accountants are tend to look at the past and, and make sure that everything is properly registered in, in the right box and, and giving the right figures to, to the management. As Treasury is more looking forward, so a kind of looking in the future, what's going on and what will happen in the future, to, uh, trying to anticipate any financial issues or financial needs that, that the company should have. So it's kind of, you know, uh, being back to back to take a favorite expression in Treasury world. Accountant and Treasurer are kind of back to back, but doing, I would say that that with the same objective of making sure that the company is well managed in terms of finance. And then, as you say, you sort of did Swift, then you moved on. You know, talk about that. I moved to a total different industry sector because I, I moved to the UCB company, which is a kind of mix of chemical and pharmaceutical company. For those who have uh, some allergies, they probably know Zyrtec, which is a favorite molecule to go with that. So I discovered what the real industry world was. And once again, the company was at the turning point of developing its international presence and mainly in the the United States on the pharmaceutical department. I had to manage the European treasury, but also implementing the US treasury at the time. That was also a very nice experience because that's uh, that was at the time I was bringing in the treasury team all the the latest developments in the technology in terms of TMS and automation with bank relationship and those kind of things. And you had your history at Swift, and obviously you were internal at Swift rather than yeah. sort of sales and things. But did you did you find that helped you? You know that exposure to sort of technology before? Or? Yeah, for sure. There was a kind of development laboratory Swift, but the, the funny things at Swift was that uh, our shareholders were our clients. That gives a little bit different approach in terms of treasury management. Uh, for all the treasurers that would probably know what I mean when discussing about the bank relationship, when your shareholders are your clients and you need to have a banker on board, that's a little bit difficulter than I would say in the normal industry. Yeah. Very different. We'll come on to the margins chat in a minute because you then did UCB, but then to Ingram Micro, and we again, and we get to Remy Contro, but you're all quite different industries. But then, so European Treasurer UCB, yeah, you got that in place and things, and then you made a move after a number of years. 
Yeah, so I stay at UCB more than seven years. And then I was proposed to an interesting move to a company called Ingram Micro, which is an IT main first year distributor, where I enter a totally different dimension because I was a group that uh, at the time was making a, a $30 billion turnover. So the, the size was much huge, much more important than, than at UCB, but in different terms, because the risk there for Treasure was that the margin in that industry is so, so low that uh, any financial risk that is not covered as a main impact on the final result. And so I was in charge of the uh, European Treasury. And then also we had a look at the Asian currency risk uh, of our colleagues in Asia and was reporting to the uh, US headquarter in, in, in California, where they were not that much concerned about dealing with the financial or the, the, the currency risk, I would say, but they were extremely uh, demanding on the reporting of it. So that was a, a kind of relationship I had to develop there, making sure that the financial risk and mainly the currency risk was under control and making sure that they clearly understand the games in, in Europe. So that, that was a difficult time, I would say, because uh, as I mentioned, we were dealing with very low margins. So any currency loss had a huge impact. And then, of course, that was a critical point of the, of the job. And it was way for thin, as you say, with the yeah. sort of making sure, you know, just that we, again, we spoke before the show, didn't we? That's an industry where I didn't feel a really bright future, I would say, because they were kind of sitting in in between and they were squeezed once on the one side by the producer like you know the big one apple ibm uh, and so forth and on the other side they were squeezed by the local distributor which want to keep their local margin alive and so by being squeezed on both sides uh, that was letting a little space for margin development in the first year distributors so that that was a difficult time i would say a turnaround of that industry but in the meantime that was priceless of being trained and 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 learned a lot of things on how to deal with critical situation and how to develop your ability to react quickly on any given situation well, this wine and spirits premium brand group. Well, whatever attracted you to that? What was what was? <laughs> well, many things. The first one being the opportunity that was given, because the, at the time the the group treasury department was mainly focused on the upper side of the balance sheet, so on on the financing. There was a need to develop the whole spectrum of the balance sheet management because they they decide at the time to quit a joint venture in terms of distribution and rebuild their own network of distribution around the world, which for treasury means that you increase your financial risk in terms of currency, in terms of interest rate, because you need to finance all those things in terms of flows. And that was very challenging. And, and that was what interested me in that project. On the other side, I would say that was probably the first time in my treasury career I could join my hobbies and my profession because I'm, I'm a wine lover so I could really enjoy the product of the group in the meantime and fascinating group I've been out to your offices and everything else but when you started Remy Control was in one shape if you like and then you've been through lots of transitions and lots of changes without getting in too deep confidential information no, no, for more, sure. yeah it's more you you've evolved as I explained, I went through the first major turn on that was the rebuilding of the distribution network around the world, which means that we create a lot of, of affiliates in different countries. And the second thing was the change in the product portfolio, because at the time I joined the group, there was only two essential, I would say, category, which was a cognac and the champagne. Cointreau was a little bit below us at the time. So now that's almost 14 years that has been in Remy Cointreau Group and we've divested in the champagne industry. We have raised the Cointreau brand as well. We've developed the portfolio with a new category like uh, whiskeys, rum, brandy. And so that's also a very interesting journey for me because that entering different process that needs to be integrated and the business model is totally different than the one I knew before. Just to give you an example between Ingram Micro and, and Remy Cointreau. At Ingram Micro, the stock we had to manage and the, the working capital that we need to put on these stocks with a three to six months horizon. As with Remy Cointreau, for the cognac branch at least, uh, we have sometimes products that are more than 100 years old, which means that the working capital needs to follow that same periodicity, at least for part of it. But the, the main essence of the business is to age 
spirits. So it's not an horizon of one to three months. It's an horizon of 10 to 100 years. And we talked about this again, when you're explaining that to some of your banking partners Mm -hmm. and things like that, that, you know, sort of giving that understanding to them when they're perhaps looking at it and they're used to dealing with other industries, you know, how do you get over it with them? What's the sort of ethos there? First of all, I should say I'm very lucky with the bankers I used to to see is that they know pretty well the spirit industry. They are quite mm. specialized, so they know about what they talk and they know about what I'm talking to them in terms mm. of constraints, needs, and, and financing. On the other hand, I've got quite a good relationship with the rating agency as well. I think on one particular side of the business, they've got the similar approach in terms of measuring the risk they take on on Remy Quattro when financing the activity. Being for the rating agency, it addresses that to the investors. And for the bank, of course, it addresses that to the credit committee of the bank. And the main fears, of course, when they invest something in the company is that the company do not bankrupt and then they do not find back their money. How they measure the financial risk is a little bit standardized across the corporates. But with Remy Quattro, which is a very unique beast, I would say, where we've a lot of age stock of spirits and we've got a relative low debt level. We have an average of uh, less than 500 million debt permanent base and the stock value of spirits that is probably more than five to six billion euros. My reasoning is very simple when they talk about financial risk for Remy Quintero. They say, okay, if I'm selling 10% of my stock, it means that Tomorrow, I have zero debt and still have 90% of my stock to sell. What is our profile of financial risk you would take on us if you finance the activity? And that's very clear, but that's something they could probably not put in a standard evaluation box because, well, I don't know on on earth a lot of company that has such a profile. It's very unique, isn't it, as well? And this is, we had some fantastic chat before this podcast about some of the challenges we faced throughout COVID, but actually more about the team. But to go back to when you first started in the group and how you established Treasury and grew Treasury, could you perhaps take us through that journey you guys have gone to? And then we'll talk about Treasury per se, you know, because some of the listeners today, they'll be in a similar situation. There might be a new Treasurer, you know, just walking in the door. What did you seek to establish throughout that time? And what's your ethos? So at the time I joined Remy Cointreau, it was decided to move the Treasury team from Paris to Brussels. The main reason was the one I mentioned is because the group was getting more and more internationalized with the new distribution network. And therefore, the treasury team had uh, to be reinforced with people that has know how to run an international treasury activity on different sides like uh, payments, but also risk hedging, like currency or interest rate, financing and those kind of things. So Brussels, where we are sitting here, was chosen because of their potential very high know-how of treasury management people. And also the fact that we're recognized as a multilingual country, which helps when you run international activities. And we had another advantage that uh, in Belgium, most of people also speak French. So for a French group, that was much more easier to do so. And I would say that because of the history of the coordination center in Belgium, we have a very good stock of people that have the the treasury management know-how. Again, if anyone looks at your LinkedIn profile, they'll see that you've got very much involved in ATEB, the Association of Treasurers in Belgium, but you were right there at the beginning of it, weren't you? And we discussed this. Maybe again, I sometimes say to listeners on the podcast, get involved in your local association and things, but you were there and you wanted one and one wasn't really there. No, that's true. So we started in 1991, in fact. And I would say that uh, it started with a kind of club of a few treasurers. I would say uh, not more than 15 treasurers of, of big corporates in Belgium. They started to meet uh, on a regular basis and exchanging information or, or best practice, I would say. And then the club was growing slowly, 20, 30, 50. And, and at some point of time, say, okay, now it's become too bigger to not structure mm. that. Then that we took the decision to create the association officially as a non-for-profit as an organization. We established this, the bylaws of the association with a clear objective that we want to share as much as possible best, best practices and also the ethic of profession and make sure that we attract young talent to that branch. Because, you know, treasury is not 
show or, or learned at university as a mm. specific specialty. It's, you know, one course amongst another long list of others. There is no clear path to treasury career. At least at that time, that was not the case. Mm. Now we see that since a few years then we have in France, but it's also in UK, I guess, some real specific masters that address treasury management. And that's mm. a good thing, I guess. That's a, that was the start of the ATEP. And then the, it grows slowly with the time. And then we've seen now more than two or three generations of, of treasurers coming on board. I quit the board of ATEP a few years ago, leaving the, the, the seats to the youngsters. And mm. I think they, they do it pretty well. Well, they do. And they do a really good job and things like that. But I think the work that you did there was, was incredible. But that helped you obviously attract some really great talented to your team. So again, for the listeners, can you just describe briefly the, the structure of your treasury team in Brussels and, and where do you, you know, because what I wanted to talk was about that team yeah. and how you've coped with COVID and in this really weird world that we live in. The team in Belgium is quite limited. Huh? So we have a yeah. team of nine people with a kind of, I would say, classical structure of treasury with a front, middle and back office. Because we are a juridical entity, we have also a, an accountant with this more specialized in treasury transaction. Since a few years now, we have had a two additional responsibilities to the treasury team. So we build up a, a payment factory for the group that has been integrated three years ago now. And uh, we also, since a few years, took in charge the credit management of the group. Because my philosophy is that when dealing with treasury issues, you need to tackle the whole cash cycle, including the credit management of clients. And that's why we integrated that into the team. And thanks to that, because that gives us the right view on how the finance of the company is around and how we can easily cap the cash that is needed for running the group. And if I take you back in time, just a year or so, just over a year or so ago, so we go back to... January 2020, mm -hmm. there was some chat, if you're not like going on about there might be this little pandemic coming along, along. You guys are all in the office, you're working together, you're a very close knit team, you were sharing ideas over a coffee and things like that. Roll on three to six months later, it's a whole different world. This is totally loaded because we had, had a really interesting chat, Luke and I, about coping with yep. COVID and coping with this world. What, what was it like? How did you go through it? Well, first of all, I would say that in the office, we are working in an open space, which means that there is a natural exchange of information without being specific on each one. But when someone has a problem or uh, some issues with a file or whatever, or discussing on the phone, everyone is hearing what he's talking about. And so is aware about the issues or, or the problem. Of course, with the COVID coming, we had to work uh, remotely from, from home. I saw that this natural exchange of information tends to diminish when working each one on his private home. Just to give you an example, the, the, the first week we were in teleworking, that was natural that uh, everyone was calling each other to make sure that they were aware about the things going on and so on. And then after a few weeks, there was one call, one or the second day or one call a week, or whatever. And suddenly there was no call anymore. So this commun natural communication had disappeared. So I had to reinstall, I would say, virtual meetings just to share information, not to deal a specific point, but in order to have everyone to exchange what they did, how they did, and then what are the concerns for the others and what the implication for each other. That's something that needs to be maintained over the time because I think we will probably not get back fully to the previous world. The world has changed and I think it's changed forever. And that's something we need to pay attention to. So I'm organizing also some, you know, teams meeting and these kind of things, even if there is no real topic on this. But just to have the, this dialogue, this, this exchange process going on, that's the way I think we will have to, to manage the future, even if we don't get back to the office on full time. But uh, that's the, one of the learning of the, of the COVID uh, crisis. And the second learning is that, uh, of course, we had the unique opportunity to test our catastrophe plan. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> because uh, as everyone was working from home with different technology, I would say uh, no one has a performance, a performance Wi-Fi or so we had to put that at the, the right level. I should say that the IT department did a fantastic job on that to make sure that everyone was aligned in terms of technology and capacity. 
but that's also something you need to pay attention to. And the recovery plan we had imagined and that we had tested from time to time, but, you know, in small pieces, that was giving us the opportunity to test it in full and for a long period. That That's something valuable for us. Another point on this as well, which I'd like to bring out as well. I was recently on an ACT panel session with a couple of other recruiters. We were saying, what had I seen throughout it? And I'd been talking to a couple of treasurers, one in particular, they'd implemented a new treasury system throughout the pandemic. This treasurer was, yeah, we did a great job. We did a great job. And I actually said, I'm not sure he did. Because the thing is, I think he was a bit oblivious to the fact that he said, oh, our team really pulled through and everything else. He didn't. He actually broke some of his team. Mm -hmm. They were just, you know, because I know some of the team members and they found it so tough to get through. They did it, but it's left them, you know, really struggling. Yeah. Now, you and I talked about this, that the fact that different people having different working cycles, you know, coping with kids, mm -hmm. but you've really shown a real, I think a real empathy, you know, not just that sort of those open meetings, but you also expressed to me about how as long as people get the job done, you yeah. didn't mind. That, you know, that, that, that's my philosophy, exactly. That, mm. uh, I think everyone in the team has a, a specific job and, and some objectives. And as long as these objectives are met and the job is done, I don't really care about the way they organize themselves. They, these are responsible people. They know what their responsibility in the team is. Of course, we still have to cope with some deadlines, like, like everyone. Mm. You know, mm. treasurers are animated by the cut of time and... <laughs> <laughs> these kind of things. But besides that, I guess that's also something the COVID has put in, in the light is that we can organize the work a little bit more to adjust our, our pace and, and our requirements, but still keeping the, the high level of performance, even if we're, done, if we're not in the office on a permanent base. But of course, I'm expecting from my team that they perform their job correctly and at the highest level possible as well. Yeah, but you've given that flexibility and we discussed the fact that you were different people, different times, different locations, but you've come through it sort of exactly, thing. Exactly. Yeah. And where do you see it then going to start to look towards the future of that? Do you see everyone back in your open office straight away or what's your planning for the future? I don't know yet because uh, we're working in a group, so we yep. need to follow group's rules as well. I cannot set rules in my own yards and don't <laughs> or ignore the rest of the group, of course. But uh, I would at least advocate for a more flexible approach, the way certain functions are fulfilled. Sometimes it's difficult, I would say, but but for some other jobs. And, and certainly if you have kids with very young kids and these kind of things where you need to have a more flexible timing because of the means. If I can compare the old approach, I would say, where yeah. you need to be in the office eight hours a day at least to perform your job, say more the Nordic approach where say, okay, the society is... It, turn to the, the family first and you work for a living and, and you don't live for working, <laughs> if I can yeah. say so. That's something we need to kind of meet in the middle and say, okay, of course you need to be devoted to your job and, and your responsibility, but as part of your entire body, your family is probably also uh, as important as that as your job. And mm. so you need to find the right mix, the right balance on that approach. I think for me, the, the right approach is when you get educated people People that know what responsibility means, they can organize their work themselves. Some freedom on that space to get them happy in their job and, yeah. and make sure that they fulfill their role correctly. Luke, we spoke before about downside mm -hmm. of this way of working as well, and that sort of links into it. And you said that open way of working, someone comes up with an idea and then it bounces off someone and everything else. You said that there were you set up the Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. but there was less of them. You know, they started because problem solving, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got a problem before, yeah, all jump on a Zoom call and four or five people work at it and great. But then over time, that sort of diminished. And that's something that you've sort of tried to keep an eye on. What's that been like? Yeah, that's why I'm now doing more and more meeting without any topics, just making sure the contact stays. I'm not sure this is the perfect answer to that change. I think we still need to work on it to, to find the best way to perform in the future, because I hope and cross fingers that we can get out of that COVID crisis and then we'll be able to adjust a little bit the way we work. I don't have the perfect answer to 
today, but I'm thinking of it. And, and I think that at least we'll have to rearrange the way we work. I was talking about flexibility, but I was also talking about communication in the team. That's something we need to find a, what, what is the ideal way of communicating, because there's probably more answer than, than one single one, but things have to change versus the past, that's for sure. Previously, you were regularly traveling a lot of the time when we met at conferences and we both love to meet people. You're very outgoing as a treasurer and like to sort of interrelate with people. But you were doing a lot of travel to your Paris office on a regular basis. Yep. Overnight, that virtually stopped. I know that we both talked about we can't wait for this to be over to actually get to meet people face to face. Why do you think that's so important? I think it's, it's even more important if you're really removed from the, the heart of the, the activity. If I take, for example, I was used to get to Paris at least once a week to meet my boss and, and the rest of the uh, central services of the group. But I was also used to visit our main affiliates at least once a year and uh, the smallest one at least once every two years. I consider that the, the physical contact is also important and it's probably even more important with people that are very remote. We are covering the, the whole planet. So we have uh, I have my team here in Brussels, but I've also part of uh, local treasury teams in, in China, in Singapore, in the US and New York, uh, in Geneva for our European center. I think that you can work remotely with those guys from time to time, but at a certain point in time, you need a physical contact because that moment that you share real things. So your philosophy, your approach of the job, how they perform, why they do so, and also the exchange of experience. It's much more natural when you are face-to-face -face with people than rather through a screen and a camera. Also, it's a very enjoyable part of your role. As you said, to, you know, Luke's got these amazing backdrops yeah. in his videos too. You know, he's got a lovely Genova there and you said it showed all the barrels and stuff, which is incredible. And as you said, Mike, you actually get to see the physical product. What, what, what was that like as well as a connecting to it? Just to, to get back to the previous thought, I, one of the important things also is to meet people locally because you're facing different culture. And for mm. me, it's essential to understand these differences, to make sure I can dialogue correctly with these guys. I'm not talking to my Chinese treasurer the same way I'm talking to my US treasurer, for example. And no discrimination at that point of time, but <laughs> it's the way you approach the things in a different way and you present things and you exchange things with these guys with a very different dialogue. This, you cannot learn that through a screen. That's something you mm -hmm. need to learn on the field. So that's why I consider this is important that from time to time you visit them or you let them come to you and visit your office as well, because that's where you've got the, the most uh, productive exchange and also where you build the trust amongst the team. For a real business that both you and I really, well, we really love. <laughs> I love your product. You love the services. Great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Luke, we could keep talking and we did before and things like that, but... You know, as we approach the end of today's show, you know, we'll put in your details in the show notes and LinkedIn and things. And lots of people I know will look at it and say, wow, what a great 30 years plus experience in Treasury, but also some of the different things you've done. One of the things I would want to mention as well, actually, Luke and I talked about that you're a board member of Goods to Give. Mm -hmm. And we'll put the details about that. Can we just touch on that briefly? Because I think, you know, I'd like people to look at it and, you know, maybe contribute or at least get maybe involved in things. If Could you just describe that for us before we move on to your final tips for people in Treasury? First of all, I think we are quite lucky guys in Treasury. I think at a certain point of your career, you need to give back to the, to the society. And I was quite astonished by looking at the number of people that live under this level of poverty in Belgium, but I guess it's the same in many countries. And my question was, what can I do to diminish that? in my position of treasurer. And so I met quite interesting people that has a concept of all the unsold products of first necessity were destroyed because that's the, that was at the time the cheapest way to do, to do so. Say, okay, but if we collect these products and we re-give that to the, the people in need, maybe that was that will be a good thing. And what can I do to do that? Well, I've got only a finance expertise, but if I bring other people with different expertise around the table, we can probably build a team that could address that in this globality. And uh, so I 
brought some people having experience in the logistics, in the juridical sector, my experience in finance, other experience uh, or people that has a very huge network of, of contact in, in the industrial sphere. All those people were put together and we developed a logistic model, kind of B2B, but uh, for people in need, where we do not ask any subsidies from the states, but we build up a model where products were given and we redistribute that to through a web shop to the social organization. And so we started that adventure in 2012, building up the model, testing it and making sure it was a good model for, for the future. And that was the case. So Goods to Give is an organization that now distributes about 6 million euro value of product per year to people in need in Belgium. We have a similar organization in France and, and, and in Spain also, and probably in other countries. But I think that's one way to give back to the society is to make your expertise available for those who need them. Fantastic. And then we'll put the link to that, to the organization in the show notes. So I'd like people to look at it because I think it's invaluable when we discussed it as well. Yeah. So. And then if there are companies that have unsold product, excess product, they can still yeah. contact us. One thing also is that now more than, than ever, people are concerned by uh, CSR mm. and not only as a, as a nice greenwashing on their balance sheet, but also all their employees are concerned by what is their company doing for, for the planet. So I think this is also nice motivation to join the to give organization we're just going to wrap up today's episode but as we do that as i say we'll put your linkedin details in the show notes looking back over this and if someone looks and said you know what i want his job not just because of the wines and spirits you know which is a good motivator <laughs> <It might be>. uh, <laughs> <laughs> but i think you know you've done a fantastic job there really great organization and group and things what tips would you give maybe the tips you give to your team or to to colleagues, what are the things that you think people should think about? For those that do not know Treasury, well, come and mm. see us. The Treasury is very modern and trendy. So <laughs> now more seriously, I think that the key here is also to keep your sen critical sense. That's first, mm. that, that one key. Uh, stay curious uh, of all the business aspects, not only the, the, the finance or Treasury one, but be curious to all the aspects of your company. And by knowing every aspect of the company, you will be much more richer and your career will probably evolve in the good way if you're involved in that this discussion. And, and also never be afraid of change. That uh, changes the, that's the things that keeps me awake because I'm curious, but because I don't want to lose the, the last train. That's something that is motivating me and Treasury is a perfect place to do so because it's a never-ending, evolving story, technology, regulation, whatever. Treasury is composed of a lot of things that change on a permanent basis. So coming back to my first words on, on this interview, I say that uh, accounting has probably evolved a little bit, but not as fast as Treasury, because Treasury is always looking for the future. Luke, amazing words. Thank you, sir. As I said, we could just keep talking, you know, and we, we did before and it was it was a fascinating pre-podcast call that went on for, you know, an hour plus. And But you're a busy treasurer, so I'm going to respect that. You've got a team to manage and everything else. So thank you very much for your time today. And we'll put your details in the show notes so people can connect to you and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you physically. Okay, well, welcome, Mike, and thank you very much. Thank you, sir.